Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for this very special broadcast. Recently, the United States Congress enacted the Sergeant First Class Heath Robinson, honoring our promise to address Comprehensive Toxics Act, shortened to the PACT Act, historically the largest health care and benefit expansion of services for uniformed service veterans of the Vietnam, Gulf War, and post-9-11 eras. Our men and women in uniform put their lives on the line daily in defense of this great nation. And for those who have served in years, and not even decades past, many have faced health challenges like asthma and cancer that are incongruent with their age, but may be associated to known and unknown risks resulting from their service and the locations and conditions in which they served. Some of these health challenges may incur disabilities that have now or will potentially manifest over time. Through the PACT Act, the federal government seeks to ensure that our veterans and survivors of veterans face fewer bureaucratic obstacles in obtaining services and benefits earned as matter of their service. Simply stated, the lessons of our predecessors who faced consequential and frankly life-altering delays to health care and benefits has resulted in the passage of this historic PACT Act. To better explain the impact and scope of these comprehensive changes, today we have health and benefits experts on hand to explain the PACT Act and answer your questions regarding screenings, qualifications, and enrollment. Here's South Carolina Department of Veterans Affairs Director of Operations Dave Roselle to explain further. Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us for this important information session about the PACT Act. The VA is actively encouraging all veterans and survivors to apply for their earned health care and benefits during this open enrollment period. But we know there's li likely a lot of questions you may have regarding eligibility, screenings, and benefits. Joining us today to help veterans, families, and survivors understand more about the PACT Act is SCDVA's own uh, Myself, David Roselle, as your moderator. Um, also, we'll have Derek Bridges, who's the Chief of Patient Benefits, Columbia USDVA office, and Marlon Hines from USDVA Benefits, who's all on screen with Woody Middleton, who handles benefits and claims. Okay, without further ado, um, let's start with uh, Woody. Uh, tell tell us some more about the PACT Act, and really, what do you think the veterans and their families will need to know? Kind of really overarching. Okay, David. Uh, uh, good afternoon to everybody, and uh, what an honor it is uh, to be here to with you folks uh, today to talk about uh, uh, the PACT Act, and uh, uh, it's uh, it is truly an honor. So uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I am Woody Middleton, the Assistant Director at the Columbia VA Regional Office. And this here is uh, Marlon Hines, our change management agent uh, in the regional office. I refer to uh, Marlon as our subject matter expert uh, on the PACT Act. Uh, we had submitted some slides, uh, so hopefully we can make those uh, viewable to the to the folks. Uh, there, uh, we see it now, so thank you. Uh, the next slide, please. <clears throat> All right, what is the PACT Act? Uh, the Promise to Address uh, Comprehensive Toxics Act of 2022 uh, is a new law that expands VA health care and benefits. That's the key there. It's VA health care and benefits for veterans exposed to burn pits or other toxic substances. Uh, this law helps us provide generations of veterans and their survivors. That's the key. And survivors uh, with the care and benefits they've earned and deserve. All right. Uh, next slide, please. We have a couple of bullets here uh, about uh, the overview of the PACT Act and what it means to VBA, Veterans Benefits Administration. And that's where all the regional offices across the country fall under is the VBA side of the house. And I'd like to highlight those first two bu uh, bullet points, uh, expands and extend eligibility for uh, VA healthcare and benefits for veterans with toxic toxic exposures, and veterans of the Vietnam, Gulf War, and post 9-11 eras. And the second bullet I'd like to highlight is that second bullet. And this adds 20 plus more presumptive conditions for burn pits, Agent Orange, and other toxic exposures. Next slide, please. 
All right, uh, a little bit about uh, the claims process. Uh, and uh, to get a disability uh, rating, a veteran uh, disability must connect to their military service. For many health conditions, veterans need to prove service caused the condition. Uh, but for some conditions, VA automatically assumes or presumes uh, that service caused the disability or the condition. And the VA calls these presumptive conditions. A VA considers a, con a condition presumptive when it is established by law or regulation, exactly what the PACT Act is. Uh, if there is a presumptive condition, veterans don't need to prove service caused the condition. The veterans only need to, to meet the service requirements for the presumption. Okay, next slide, please. A little bit about the, the Vietnam era. Uh, the VA has added uh, five new locations to the presumptive list, presumptive locations for Vietnam era. Any uh, U.S. or Royal Thai military base in Thailand, uh, La Laos, uh, and we also see Cambodia. We also see Guam and, um, and or American Samoa. And the last bullet is uh, Johnston Atoll. Uh, and then lastly, if you have served uh, on active duty uh, at any of these locations, we'll automatically assume or presume that you have had uh, exposure to Agent Orange. The next slide, please. All right. Uh, uh, if you have served in any of these locations in time periods, we've determined that you had exposure to burn pits or other toxins. All right, we see some bullets there about uh, on or after September the 11th, uh, Afghanistan, uh, Djibouti, uh, Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, Uzbekistan, Yemen, and any of the airspace above any of these locations. Uh, on or after August the 2nd of 1990, uh, Bahrain, Iraq, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, uh, Somalia, United Air Emirates, and uh, the airspace above any of these locations. All right, next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, continuing on with the overview here, uh, VA has added three uh, new response efforts to, uh, to the list of presumptive locations for radiation exposure. And uh, we see the, the cleanup of ENIWAC, uh, a tool, uh, cleanup of the Air Force B-52 bomber, carrying nuclear we weapons off the coast of Pal Palomares, Spain. I know I've uh, just uh, horribly pronounced those names, so my, I do apologize for that. And then uh, the next bullet is response to a fire on board a, an Air Force B-52 bomber carrying nuclear weapons, weapons near Thule Air Force uh, Base in Greenland. Uh, again, if veterans took part in any of these efforts, the VA will automatically assume or presume you had exposure to radiation. The next slide, please. All right, uh, about Agent Orange, uh, there's two new conditions uh, that uh, uh, we've added. And uh, the big one, obviously, is high blood pressure or hypertension, okay? Uh, the next slide, please. And the VA has also added more than 20 burn pit and other uh, toxic exposure presumptive conditions based on the PACT Act. Uh, we can see the cancers listed below, brain cancer, gastrointestinal, uh, glioblastoma, uh, head cancer of any type, kidney cancer, lymphatic cancer of any type, lymphoma of any type, melanoma, neck cancer of any type, pancreatic cancer, and reproductive cancer, and respiratory uh, cancer uh, of any type. Uh, the next column is the illnesses that are now presumptive. Asthma that was diagnosed after service, chronic bronchitis, chronic, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, chronic rhinitis, chronic sinusitis, constructive, constrictive uh, bronchiolitis or obliterative <laughs> bronchiolitis. Marlon, you got to help me with these. <laughs> I'm on my own. <laughs> uh, emphysema, uh, granulias, granulomatous disease. I know I just horribly pronounced that. Uh, Intertestinal lung disease, pleuritis, pulmonary fibrosis, and sarcoidosis. The next slide, please. I'm glad we got through that one. And uh, what about additional benefits and/or survivors? We'll 
If the veteran has passed away from any of these conditions, we encourage uh, all the survivors to apply for benefits. A little bit uh, uh, about the application process, va.gov backslash uh, pact. Uh, uh, and also uh, conveniently located that Marlon has put in here is this, uh, uh, what do we call this code, Marlon? QR code. Yeah, QR code that... Uh, uh, veterans can scan over and it should direct them uh, for more information about the PACT Act. And our last slide, please. Uh, we've also uh, uh, set up a 1-800 uh, line for uh, veterans or survivors to reach out, and that is 1-800-MY-VA-411. And again, uh, more information at va.gov backslash PACT, P-A-C-T. And David, uh, that's all we have at this uh, at this point. Uh, we will be around for any type of questions. And David, your mic is muted. I'm going to turn it over to Tarek. So, Derek, what should veterans know regarding enrollment and eligibility? Good. Thank you for having me here today, Dave. I'm. Uh, I look forward to giving this information out to the veterans and. I'm just glad to be a part of it and help in any way I can and answering those questions. Uh, so for veterans who served on active duty in a theater of combat operations during a period of war after the Persian Gulf War or in combat against a hostile force during a period of hostilities after November 11th, 1998, and were, who were discharged or released between September 11th, 2001, and October 1st, 2013. If they have not previously enrolled in VA healthcare, they will have a special enrollment period between October 1st, 2022 through October 1st, 2023. This includes those that have never applied and those currently in a rejected enrollment status. Uh, during this one year period, they will have another opportunity to apply for enrollment. We strongly encourage them to do so to ensure that we can provide them any care they need now or in the future. Enrollment is free, there's no annual costs, and your care may be free as well. The veteran must complete a 1010EZ or an EZR and present it to their local VAMC and submit the on application online by mail, by fax, or call one 877 222-8387. Uh, veterans in a rejected status should not, they won't be automatically updated. This group of veterans may be enrolled in the marketplace insurance and enrolling in VA healthcare would result in them losing their eligibility for health insurance. This group of veterans will be placed in the priority group six once the system is enhanced until September 30th, 2023. After this time period, they will be moved to Priority Group 8C. Veterans, an example of this is a veteran's discharge on June 28, 2015 and enrolled on May 30th, 2021 and was over the income threshold. The veteran's current priority group is rejected in 8G. Veterans records will need a rejection override, which we do in enrollment eligibility. And this is required to submit what we call a heck alert to notify them of the change. Veterans new to combat eligibility end date will be June 27th, 2025, placed in priority group six, unless the eligibility for the veteran is higher when the system is enhanced. The veteran must complete a form 1010EZ or EZR and present that to their local VMC and submit those online by mail or fax. Uh, veterans in a rejected status, again, should uh, not be automatically updated. Uh, the veterans enrolled in the marketplace and in insurance, it would eliminate them from losing their, or that would make them lose their eligibility. Uh, so an important thing that, that we're seeing here Any veteran that has a discharge on or before September 13th are not eligible for the 10-year enhanced combat eligibility. 
and reject overrides are approved for those enrolling based on a one-year special enrollment period. These are newly enrolled veterans that have never been known to the system and those currently known to the system. For more information and guidance, please reach out to the following groups, uh, VHA, HEC, MS, EED, Correspondence Team, or VHA, HEC, MS, ESO, VA, VISN Liaisons. The PACT Act enrollments will follow your normal add a person process, which is what we go through in this process. In addition to completing an enrollment and bringing the record to a final determination, we would create a heck alert to update for these PACT Act things such as Ancient Orange, Airborne, Hazard, and Burn Pit Registry, or Combat Override, Gulf War, or Ionizing Radiation. If a veteran is currently enrolled and they present for care or eligibility questions, they must submit a heck alert if they meet the eligibility criteria. So that would be what we would do in, in enrollment and eligibility for that. Uh, we submit a PACT Act Ancient Orange heck alert if the veteran meets the following for Ancient Orange locations during the specified periods, which is Republic of Vietnam between January 9th 1962 and May 7th of 1975, Thailand at any U.S. or Royal Thai base between January 9th, 1962 and June 30th, 1976, Laos between December 1st, 1965 and September 30th, 1969, certain provinces in Cambodia between April 16th, 1969 and April 30th of 1969. Guam or American Samoa or their territorial waters between January 9th, 1962 and July 31st of 1980. Johnston Atoll or a ship that called there between January 1st, 1972 and September 30th of 1977. Uh, submitting a PACT Act for ionizing radiation, we also submit a heck alert for that. Uh, so we ser served in radiation area at the following location and during the following periods. Cleanup of in Inuitak Atoll from January 1st, 1977 through December 31st, 1980. Cleanup of Air Force Base B-52 bomber carrying nuclear weapons off the coast of Palomares, Spain from January 17, 1966 through March 31st, 1967. Response to the fire on board an Air Force B-52 <coughs> bomber carrying nuclear weapons near Thule Air Force Base in Greenland from January 21st, 1968 to September 25th, 1968. We also are submitting uh, PACT Act Airborne Hazardous for the Burn Pit Registry, for, and we submit a heck alert for that. Uh, this has kind of been a, a point of contention here with this Burn Pit Registry. If you served in any of the locations and time periods, we've determined that you have a, had exposures to burn pits or other toxins. We call this having a presumptive exposure. On or after September 11, 2001, in any of these locations, Afghanistan, Djibouti, Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, Uzbekistan, Yemen, the airspace between any of these locations. Uh, also on these locations, on or after August 2nd, 1990, any of these locations, Bahrain, Iraq, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Somalia, the United Arab Emirates, the airspace above any of these locations. The one caveat to this when you're submitting through the burn pit registry that we found out is that Somalia is a location that is not in the burn pit registry as a location uh, to be submitted through there. Does not mean that you 
cannot get authorized care through that or have a submit a claim for it. Just means the burn pit registry is not recognizing that location at this time. Bottom line, you would submit a claim through your regional office for that. Uh, the registry at that point would be null and void if the location is not appearing there. Uh, you, we also submit a PACT Act uh, Gulf War Heck Alert. Uh, if you come into the Welcome Center, we, if you served in a theater of combat operations between November 11th, 1998, and discharged on or after September 11th, 2001, and by September 30th of 2013. Uh, this is not an all-inclusive list, but Bahrain, Kuwait, Qatar, Somalia, Afghanistan, Egypt, Lebanon, Uzbekistan, Iraq, Oman, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Djibouti, Jordan, Syria, Yemen, and the airspace above any of these locations. Oh, it's this one right here. At the VAMC enrollment eligibility staff, we use a bunch of links to be able to reference uh, information about the PACT Act, but you can reference uh, information at the PACT Act at www.va.gov backslash PACT Act, and it will show you information about that there. And that's all I have, Dave. And that's all the information currently that I have. Well, Derek, it's amazing that I asked the second question. I got a second PowerPoint. And I also know that these PowerPoints are both available. Uh, I've seen them and they're online. So the, all this information is, is out there, right? So we can Absolutely. go to the website and see both of these if we wanted to follow up and look at them later, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, but we are starting to get some questions. So uh, no more freebies, uh, no more PowerPoint presentations, only uh, us answering your questions. So. I'm going to send it to South Carolina Department of Veterans Affairs' own Kiana, who I think has a couple of questions that are already loading up in our queue. <laughs> right, you'll send it back to me while we work through it. Okay, uh, we're having a slight audio problem, and that's okay. Um, we'll, we're going to go fix that, and we'll, we, we, your, import, your questions are important to us, and we're going to get to them, we promise. But I'm going to go back to Woody and Marlon, because uh, they no longer have PowerPoint to defend themselves. So, um, Woody, uh, I just listened to this brief. This is the third time I've heard it. This is a large population we're talking about. This is, a, this is, a, this is an increase in the number of people you're going to see. So how does this change what you're doing with benefits and claims at the VA? Uh, Dave, that's a great question, and, and thank you for it. Uh, we we hope uh, through our hiring efforts uh, and training efforts uh, for the PACT Act that the, the the transition into this claims process will be seamless. Uh, we have seen no backlogs here at the regional office thus far, and we are hopeful that we can continue that trend. So uh, we do expect to see an increase, but our we've been blessed with uh, many 20 plus uh, claims examiners hiring. And we were hopeful that that hiring will offset any kind of backlog. So uh, seamless thus far, we're hopeful that that will continue. That's great, Woody. And then I'm, I'm gonna shoot a question to Marlon, my friend out there. So as someone who's probably out there watching and, and just listened to the great brief that Derek gave for enrollment eligibility, like, and are thinking, man, this is it's time for me to apply, or a widow or spouse that's saying, I need to apply. What should they do? What's the next step after seeing this right here? Well, Dave, thanks for asking me the question. I think um, the next step would be to get a hold of a service officer to see if they can put you in contact with either someone at the regional office, if you don't know where to go exactly in the regional office, so that you can get uh, some information or to the hospital uh, to get enrolled. The hospital has some great folks when you enter on enter onto the campus that can guide you to the enrollment and eligibility uh, department. The important part in addition to that is even though we provided you with the va.gov backslash pack or the 1-800-MY-VA-411 number, 
the 800-827-1000 number is still a good number um, that is used for any general questions, pack related or not, for veterans and their survivors. And Dave, just piggybacking on Marlon's response there, and you captured uh, everything. I, I would just add one more additional uh, uh, item is that, uh, hey, we're open for business. And uh, for folks that are in the uh, com Columbia commuting area or happen to be in the area, come see us. We've got uh, public contact representatives here that uh, are, are, are trained, well-versed on the PACT Act and, and all that it allows. And we would love to assist any veterans that, uh, or survivors that uh, come in the doors of the regional office. Hey, that's, that's great news, Woody. And, and thank you, Marlon, for your, for your response. Yeah, we, we just really want to you know, saturate the audience with the ability to reach out and to find you and to know that you're open for business. That's important as we've come out of COVID and getting offices open again. And But you guys never quit working. But I do want to flip it to Kiana. Uh, I think we've got her uh, audio restored. So, and we want to get your questions. So please send them in if you're listening. Yeah, so our first question comes from a YouTube user, Notorious DLB. Uh, this person says that they were stationed in Turkey leading up to and during the Gulf, the first Gulf War from November of 1992, February of 1992. The VA sent them documents on eligibility. However, they did not see Turkey on the slides that were presented. So they wanted to know if you can speak more on that, um, letting them know if Turkey is one of those areas that is eligible for, you know, the PACT Act um, benefits. Okay, I'm going to send it to Derek, uh, excuse me, to uh, Marlon Woody to answer that one. <clears throat> Absolutely. Uh, what, what, what we uh, provided in our PowerPoint, uh, it did not list Turkey. However, uh, I would say uh, to, to our, our, our question, uh, our veteran that has uh, phoned or dialed in, uh, uh, I would suggest that to uh, submit the application, go to your service organization, uh, give us the documentation and let us make a decision on uh, any kind of eligibility. We'll go through all the, the, the channels uh, with any veteran uh, to, to make sure that uh, they are entitled. And if not, we will uh, clearly explain why. And then uh, one more question. We also have another YouTube viewer here, uh, RJD. Their question, uh, basically, they want to know about exposure to Agent Orange and burn pits at stateside locations not listed on PACT Act geography. They wanted to know if the list will be expanded to include these locations or if that was just all. Yeah. Well, that's always a possibility. As we have seen the number of presumptive conditions that continue to grow, with time, that's always a possibility, uh, but the PACT Act right now is just covering what we did, discussed in our PowerPoint. Okay, great, thank you, for, thank you for those questions and keep sending them in, please. Okay, so we're gonna do a quick uh, segue here to talk about the Big Red Barn, who is helping our heroes thrive. That's the mission of the Big Red Barn Retreat near Columbia. The Big Red Barn recently signed an agreement to join South Carolina Department of Veteran Affairs, South Carolina Veteran Coalition, adding to the wealth of resources available to veterans and service members across the state. Our photojournalist, Avery Ledwell, shows us more about the Big Red Barn and the holistic services it offers to veterans, service members, and first responders. Today, we're here at the Big Red Barn Retreat. We are here today to sign an MOU. This MOU allows the Big Red Barn Retreat to become a part of the South Carolina Veteran Coalition. So the Veteran Coalition Powered by Combined Arms is a tool that refers veterans to different resources in South Carolina. The collaboration between the Big Red Barn and South Carolina Department of Veterans Affairs is very important. The Big Red Barn understands the unique challenges that veterans are facing today in the community. The Big Red Barn offers unique programs especially designed for veterans. It provides a way for veterans to connect to the community of people who have shared experiences. We're, we're glad the Big Red Barn can formally uh, become part of the coalition network uh, throughout the state of South Carolina that's focused on helping veterans and letting them thrive and live their best lives. And the Warrior Path program, I went through it myself. It's a seven day in resident course. And it really focused on post-traumatic growth and growing from trauma and really 
going through that training, we call it training and we don't call it therapy. Uh, all the instructors are, f are not mental health therapists. We're all former veterans that are instructors or first responders that have had trauma going through this course and then uh, going through the training to become an instructor here. And the results are, you know, amazing. You're seeing 40, 50% uh, drops in uh, symptoms of post-traumatic stress and you're seeing 40, 50% increases in post-traumatic growth as far as relationships and communications. Um, but a lot of people coming through here, uh, through the, the Warrior Path program, they're struggling with life. And uh, this gives them the opportunity to give, it, it puts a lot of people's mission back in life, gives them purpose back in life, and they come out stronger. So when we talk about post-traumatic growth, one of the things that's connected to it is the opportunity for an individual to recognize their own ability to thrive basically taking charge of your own life and, and living the life that you deserve, whether you're a veteran, a first responder, but someone who has made a sacrifice to take care of other people and be something or part of something that's bigger than themselves. And so that's what we do here at the Big Red Barn Retreat on a, on a daily basis. And so I, I focus on post-traumatic growth training um, and being able to provide that information to people who are, are seeking a way to provide clarity and give themselves purpose again in their lives. And so uh, we, we get to do that on a daily basis here. Um, and, and we do that through various forms of training. Hey, I'm sure proud of that video. Great job, Avery. Uh, really, really stood out on what we're trying to do. And I appreciate that. And you can learn more about the Big Red Barn Retreat and other South Carolina Veteran Coalition partners uh, by visiting our website, which I'll spell out for you. It's scdva.sc.gov. Lots of other videos about partners in there and produced by our own Avery, who's doing a great job. Hey, so if you're just joining us, uh, we're talking about the PAC Act. Um, all of this is related because we're, you know, we're taking care of veterans across the state of South Carolina. But we want to get back to some questions. And so uh, I got Derek and Woody and Marlon, and it, I, hopefully no one asked I'm going to turn it back to uh, Woody and Marlon and say, how, uh, how will the PACT Act affect VA benefits and care overall? Okay, David, uh, you beat out on this there for a second. Uh, could you please repeat the question? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no so worries. I think it was a mute issue. How will affect VA benefits and care overall? Uh, okay, uh, well, uh, we, we do expect to see an increase in uh, claims coming in the door, and uh, we hopefully uh, will be able to stay on top of that workload. We've done some significant hiring at the, at the regional office. Uh, uh, we uh, are going through the claims process, uh, and our, our rationale here at the regional office, give all these veterans, give all these uh, survivors every benefit that they are entitled to. So uh, to answer your question, we do expect to see an increase in claims. We do expect to see an increase in uh, claims granted uh, and monetary benefits uh, uh, delivered to these veterans and, and survivors for what they deserve. And so that's, uh, that's what we expect to see, David. Okay, thanks, Woody. That's, that's a great response. And, and for the folks that started from the beginning, we may be repeating a little bit, but there's some folks that probably heard about this or heard from a friend this is on. So we may... We may hit a few things twice, but it's because they're that important. So, Derek, I'm going to turn to you and ask, how will eligibility specific to the PACT Act be determined? Uh, so thank you for that, Dave. Uh, so the first thing uh, with the PACT Act when you come in to us um, is that our process will be that we, if it's not already on your eligibilities list, then we will uh, you know, look up to determine if you were in one of the areas that's specified in the PACT Act and we'll include those documents that's submitting a heck alert to our Health Enrollment and Eligibility Center. Um, and that kind of updates the record and kind of gives them a numbers on who's submitting claims for this. Um, after that, uh, it go, all goes to filing a claim and going through the regional office and that process. So it's not a huge impact to our area, but we are seeing a, a slight uptick in, in veterans coming in, uh, requesting information about the PACT Act or submitting 
the heck alerts that I speak about. Um, and, you know, we're going through hiring a few more staff as well to try and staff up to make sure we have enough to, to handle that influx. Um, but we seem to be handling it just fine and, and things seem to be going really well. Um, so I welcome you to come into the Welcome Center and, and help us get you your eligibilities that you do. And we can submit those requests in that heck alert and kind of guide you. We, we do have a VSO on site that we can lead you to to uh, submit claims through them or you can welcome to go to the regional office. Okay, all of those are trusted partners. And so that's that's a fact. What I envision at home right now is there are probably some people, some veterans who are whipping out their DD-214s and they're doing a scan and they're wondering if they are matching those locations. Is that what is that what you're looking for in eligibility criteria is it does it say Afghanistan? Does it say flew over? And, and if they don't have that, what do they need? Uh, so, I mean, you know, anything documenting that information that shows it through those time periods, you're absolutely correct. If it's on the DD-214, we want to see it there and show that time period. And we could submit that through the process of the heck alert that we spoke about. If it's not there um, and you believe it is, we have to show proof that it is. So um, we would have to, you know, we can still guide you to the VSO and, and have you go through a process of submitting a claim. And they can dig into it further when they do go through that claim process to determine that. Um, but for us, uh, we have to show that proof to submit that heck alert. So we would need some sort of proof. But we do have the ability to pull information up in our system that you may not have, that we might be able to see those locations. Mm -hmm. And we can print that information out and submit that alert with for you as well. Because that's the key, right? It's the eligibility for this specifically by location. Correct. It's specific. It has to be at that location and during that time period. Okay. So I'm going to rewind just a second. I'm going to send it back over to Woody and Marlon. So there might be some spouses and widows out there that are listening that are saying, I don't even know what a DD-214 and or I don't even know where my husband's DD-214 is. It might be in the safe deposit box. It might be in his personal papers. What if a spouse or widow can't find that DD-214 or someone's in agent care and they've locked their stuff up. How do we get another DD-214? And what does that DD-214 do? Uh, well, David, thank you uh, very much uh, for the question. And Derek, I got to compliment you on your last response. You, you were spot on and you nailed it. So uh, nicely done on that last response. As far as our, our folks that, uh, uh, that need assistance, uh, we have a couple of avenues for, for them uh, to uh, allow us the opportunity to assist them. And uh, we encourage and we foster an environment here at the regional office where we welcome visitors. Uh, so uh, we're hopeful that uh, a number of folks can come in to visit our, our, our people, meet face to face and discuss these, uh, these scenarios where we can help uh, the widows that uh, are struggling uh, to find these documentation or to grasp an understanding of what the PAC deck is and and uh, what it what it allows, what uh, potential entitlement that there is out there. So that's first and foremost. We, that's the environment we have here at the regional office. We're open for business. Please come see us. And if the, that does not uh, uh, allow itself to happen, uh, there are a couple of one eight hundred numbers that are available. For, uh, for folks uh, to call. Uh, the traditional 1-800-827-1000 line is always an option. Uh, we've also set up the 1-800 line for specifically to assist with PACDAC inquiries, and that is 1-800-MY-VA-411. And uh, so uh, uh, those folks have been trained on uh, uh, everything there is to know about uh, the PACDAC. <coughs> And uh, Marlon educated me earlier during the commercial break. And uh, David and folks, I would like to compliment uh, the Red Barn on that uh, commercial break. I, I, I whispered to Marlon here, I said it was very informative. It was a nicely done video. Uh, but uh, he educated me that uh, the PACT Act is to, we are adding uh, uh, locations, adding disabilities to what has already been established uh, by VA uh, through uh, earlier presumptive uh, uh, conditions uh, and laws uh, and guidance. Uh, so uh, this is in addition to what's already been on the table. If there are questions out there, and Marlon referenced the one about Turkey, 
uh, we we do encourage those folks to give us a call, come see us, and uh, so we can uh, uh, have uh, an understanding of what's uh, what's out there and what's uh, entire what's out there for eligibility for these veterans. Thank thank you very much, and I'm, I'm going to take it back to Derek to talk about uh, I believe wartime. Yeah, I just wanted to elaborate a little bit on the DD-214 question that you posed about um, if you don't have your DD-214. Uh, we do have contacts to give you for uh, the National Archive system where you can request your DD-214 from the National Archives. In some cases, these veterans that are, you know, back in 1950 or 1960s or a late time frame, they don't have a DD-214. And so the archive sometimes has those. And so we can provide that information so you can write them directly and request your DD-214 if we're not able to approve it, your time frame that you need for being eligible through the PACT Act. Thank you. Yeah, that's, the, that's really important for hopefully people that are listening out there. If you don't have the DD-214, which is the the proof of discharge and the conditions and where you were and your time of service and all that. So for the family members out there, if you don't know where that is or what it is, it's time now to ask because it might take a minute, right? I mean, it's going to the National Archives. That's that's kind of a big deal, right? That's correct. The time frame of them getting back to you does take some time. So it's good to get on it now and submit that. And some of the older veterans, you know, I, I saw one the other day. It was not a DD-214. It was a DD-217. Um, so sometimes it's not a DD-214, depending on when you served. The DD-217 is still an acceptable document for enrollment and eligibility. Um, so, and that doesn't show all of the extended time frames that the DD-214 does. So we may still have to request something from the National Archives uh, to get that time frame, but that DD-217 would get you enrolled <laughs> and eligible. So if, yeah, if you're out there and you don't know what we're talking about, we've got people that can answer your questions. So uh, make sure you contact uh, us or uh, through the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, and we'll get you to the National Archives and make sure you have either that TD-217 or 214, uh, both of which will be uh, the proof that you need to, uh, specifically for the PACT Act and really for any benefits, right? I mean, that's really ultimately what we're here to talk about today. So um, we talked about it briefly. So, uh, you know, I specifically gave a shout out to um, survivors and spouses and things like that. So I'll send it back over to Woody though for, can you tell us a little bit more about like survivors of veterans and, and is the benefit changed based on the fact that they're no longer with us? Okay. Uh, well, when we have a widow applying for benefits based on a veteran that is deceased, uh, that's called a de uh, dependency indemnity compensation. Us here in the VA and our stakeholders, uh, you folks, we call it DIC. And uh, so uh, there would be an application uh, submitted for DIC based on those, uh, those new presumptives, based on those new locations. And then what happens at that point, we, uh, uh, the VA makes a determination on entitlement to a DIC. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and then uh, I'm going to ask a question right back to uh, the two of you, if you don't mind. But um as we talk about you're open for business and we talk about uh the the role of the veterans benefits administration now let's talk about the health side so you know what role do va hospitals and cbox what role are they going to play in this whole um eligibility and criteria for the pact act and the claims that they're going to submit david would that be a question for us uh, at va or is that a question for derek well i'll i'll say i'll take either yeah. You're closest. You go first, Those, and we'll let uh, them finish. So, you know, we currently have eligibility staff at, at the Greenville location. We also have staff, enrollment and eligibility staff, at the Orangeburg location. We are adding staff to uh, other locations coming very soon, uh, so to allow you to be able to go into enrollment and eligibility and do the same process that we talked about earlier. Um, but I don't believe any of these areas have any veteran service officers available to them. They would want to reach out to their county VSO in that position to go through a claims process. But again, the process for the CBOX and the other VAs would be the same as the heck alert that we spoke about of submitting your DD-214 to show those time periods uh, just to make sure that the alert is there. And then again, filing the claim or with regional office or the veteran service officer 
in right. your area. So different than when you transition from the military and you go and get your uh, your physical and you and you submit that on your behalf. Definitely different than that. Yes, sir. Uh, it's you know just basically, uh, you know, you the submitting the. DD-214 is basically uh, getting it to us to show that time period. And then the heck alert goes to health enrollment eligibility to have them acknowledge that time frame and that location, and then add that to the locations that you've been to in your, in our system. Uh, but that doesn't start the claims process. The veteran service officer and the regional office is who starts your claims process. Starts the claim process. Okay. I just imagine there might be people that are running out trying to find out if they have something that meets the criteria, but it's really about the eligibility based on your location. That's I think correct. that's an important distinction to have, I think. So um, I think we're going to uh, take another quick transition to the South Carolina veteran of the quarter. So uh, we're really proud here at uh, SCDVA to try to recognize the veterans in, in our community across our state. And so um, we would like today to send a special congratulation to U.S. Army Sergeant Brennan Beck as our very first veteran of the quarter for October through December of 2022. Sergeant Beck was selected by an internal selection committee after receiving the highest score for meeting the criteria that being considered. Uh, and he, I might want to mention he was nominated by his wife, who's a proud uh, spouse. And here's what he had to say about receiving this honor. Hey, Brennan Beck here, and I just want to say what an honor it is to be named the South Carolina Veteran of the Quarter. Um, it truly is an honor to me and my family. Um, and speaking of family, I just want to say thanks to my wife, Ashley, for nominating me last year to be South Carolina Veteran of the Week. And I wanted to nominate Brennan because he means the world to us, and he works hard every day to, to serve our family, and he works hard to serve veterans across South Carolina, and I appreciate him so much for that. And I just wanted, he deserves every honor and award he gets. You know, this is truly an honor, and um, but even more so, it's just an honor to have worked with the South Carolina Department of Veterans Affairs as the Low Country Regional Integration Officer um, over the last year. Plus, um, just to, to serve and support my fellow veterans, uh, to work alongside them and their families, um, and to just try and, and make leave it a little bit better for veterans across the state um, than things were. I mean, that truly is the honor of a lifetime, and I want to I want to thank SCDVA uh, for the opportunity to do that. Um, I want to thank my fellow veterans for putting the trust um, and, and faith in me to be an advocate and and, uh, and an ally for them. Um, and I want to thank our, our, our military families for supporting our warriors um, while they're serving, but also when they come home. And I um, just want to say uh, thanks for this honor and uh, God bless our troops. You're the best daddy ever! You're the best daddy ever! Oh, uh, yeah, I had to put my tissue away for that uh, beautiful moment with Brennan Beck and his family. But uh, Brennan Beck, uh, as I mentioned, was with the department previously, uh, did a great job for us. He lives down in the low country. Uh, he's doing a great thing for veterans as a volunteer now. Uh, but he's now officially in the running to become the South Carolina Veteran of the Year, which we are looking forward to naming our first in November of 2023. Uh, we will announce a new Veteran of the Quarter in April from our next round of Veterans of the Week honorees. And you can find more information on how to nominate a veteran for the Veteran of the Week by visiting our website. Again, that's scdva.sc.gov. And we beg you to send uh, nominations in because we want to recognize far and wide across the state of South Carolina. So uh, yeah, welcome back. If you're just joining us, uh, you missed a lot because we had a great conversation about the PAC deck here. We've got uh, some super smart people from the uh, United States Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, if, whether it's eligibility, whether it's benefits, uh, all of which we're trying to answer those questions because those seem to be the most common questions we get. Uh, but without further ado, I want to turn it to uh, our world famous Kiana, who's got a few questions that are coming in that she wants to try to, to at least field. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so um, this first question that I'm going to ask, um, it's pertaining to the surviving spouses and children of veterans who may have recently passed. Is there anything in the PAC Act that might pertain to what it is that they may need to do in order to receive those benefits? I'll send that over to VBA. 
uh, <clears throat> if I heard the question right, it was about uh, entitlement to uh, uh, surviving spouses and or children. Is yes. that correct? All right. Uh, so if the veteran uh, met any of the criteria serving in any of those locations, uh, had uh, you know documented exposure uh, in, in one of those locations or served in one of those locations, and uh, the, the, the widow uh, is submitting a claim for DIC that we referenced earlier, then, uh, you know, there could possibly be entitlement. Uh, regarding children, uh, if the uh, child is uh, under the age of 18, then there could be entitlement uh, as well. Uh, and if they're in school uh, under the age of 23, uh, from 18 to 23, there could also be entitlement for DIC. Uh, bottom line is uh, we can't make a decision without an application. So we encourage, we, we are asking uh, almost to the point of begging for uh, if there is potential entitlement out there, submit an application. Let us make the decision on whether there is entitlement or not. So uh, we encourage everybody uh, if there's uh, the remote chance, any chance of uh, having entitlement, please submit an application. Let us make the decision. With that, David, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, great answer. And I think, Kiana, we got a few more, yeah, right? Yeah, we have I'm one more question. Um, this question comes from Jacqueline Gamble. She says that her father was a combat wounded Marine vet, uh, Vietnam veteran. He was receiving compensation for his gunshot wound and Agent Orange exposure for heart conditions. Um, she did recall him mentioning that he was at Camp Lejeune prior to deployment for a period of time. He did pass away in 2020 uh, with recurring kidney cancer. Um, Jacqueline and her family, they were in the process of requesting records to make a claim for water contamination when her father did pass uh, within home hospice. And she wanted to find out if and when he was at Camp Lejeune. Um, it was not on his DD-214. And does the PACT Act has, have any provisions um, for water contamination at Camp Lejeune? So that was her question. OK. Uh, Marlon, jump in if I don't tell this story correct. The PACT Act does not uh, have any uh, uh, conditions or uh, uh, any association with the Camp Lejeune contaminated water. Uh, regarding the question about whether he uh, served at Camp Lejeune, I would write us in a statement, uh, and it may be a question that we have to go to DOD about, but uh, go ahead and, and furnish the statement into the, into the VA. Let us, uh, let us consider that question about uh, service at Camp Lejeune. But uh, again, to going back to the initial question about association with PACDAC and Camp Lejeune, there's no association there. Marlon, did I tell that right? All right. Thank you, sir. With that, we'll turn it back to you. Okay, great. Yeah, those are those are some great questions. Kind of please, please pop on uh, if there's anything else that we want to add. So uh, we only have a few minutes left and we hope the listeners and followers have stayed with us. Uh, but uh, we're going to kind of wrap up the discussion and just want to kind of turn it over and see if there are any uh, final thoughts that you'd like to add as we, we kind of you know, close this for the day, but know that no more questions are going to come in over time. Yeah. Um, you know, the biggest thing is the same as Woody said, we're open for business. Uh, we want you to come in. We want to be able to address your concerns and get any of your eligibilities that are due to you. Uh, and here at the Dorn VA, we do a fantastic job of making sure that we go through every avenue of looking for any of that for you or trying to get any of those eligibilities for you. So please, I urge you, I almost beg you to make sure you're coming in and submitting uh, requests as, as you need be. And we can try and look into your eligibilities and submit what we need to to make them see those things. Or we can request your National Archive stuff to get your DD-214s to determine if it was during that time period. But we can't do that without you coming in to us. So please do. Come on in. Great appeal. We also have 46 counties with County Veterans Affairs officers out there that that also can assist, right? And then that will be processed at the county office. Uh, we have regional offices that we've talked about, whether it's at Ralph H. Johnson down in Charleston or here in Columbia at the Dorn VA. Uh, but Marlon, uh, I don't want to turn it back to you. Any, anything else y'all would like to wrap up from, from your side on the, the VBA? 
I'll take it to the opportunity I'll turn it over for Mar uh, to Marlon for any additional thing. It's really about partnership and uh, getting uh, the message out uh, to the communities. And this is a great forum to do so. We hope to be invited to future uh, forums. David, Derek, uh, again, it's about partnership. Uh, we are looking uh, for opportunities to partner with all the 46 counties, uh, any service organization, uh, to get the news out about the PACT Act. And as Derek mentioned, uh, you know, partnering with the hospitals and getting claims in the door. That's what we want to see. And uh, if, the, if, if we've got people out there that are thinking, hmm, I wonder if I'm in, uh, anybody, if I'm entitled to this or if my mother's entitled to this based on a, a death of a veteran, please come see us. And uh, we, we welcome you. We are definitely open for business. Uh, we invite anyone that uh, has those thoughts in their mind, come see us. And uh, uh, we will gladly uh, uh, take uh, take the issues and, and run with it and let us to make the decision on entitlement. Marlon, anything else to add? Uh, just um, every, this was a great platform. It was a great show. Um, the messaging is right. Um, I know we focused on the PACT Act, but I would just like to say for all those veterans, uh, survivors and dependents, um, you know, it's one day a year, we say it's Veterans Day, but from the regional office to all our veterans out there, um, thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you, Marlon and Woody and Derek. And, and, and on behalf of, uh, of the secretary who gave great opening remarks on this, you know, I think the message that we want to share is that this is all about partnership. I mean, there, you know, I think Derek, you mentioned it. There's also a number of veteran service organizations out there that help with benefits and claims and uh, and they're certainly all doing great things. It all eventually gets to the VBA for assessment and then uh, notification and then we get them enrolled into the VHA, which the VA is also putting a lot of pressure on to make sure that folks are enrolled in the VHA. So I would say, you know, on behalf of the secretary, thank you to the three of you for really painting this picture better for us. I mean, I, this is the third time I sat through a briefing uh, from the VA town hall. I sat through a briefing through our own accreditation training where we accredit those County Veterans Affairs offices. And then now uh, actually having sat through this, I, I feel, uh, you know, just knowledgeable enough to be dangerous. I will always defer to someone uh, like the folks that are in this room uh, and the folks on the screen. But uh, on behalf of the secretary, thank you so much for the time today, for the information and know that the coalition out there in the South Carolina is willing to work together and take care of veterans, take care of that with their needs, their give them the right referral to get their benefits, to discover their eligibility and find out what they deserve and really to get them to thrive. And so that's this is one small piece of the greater good that a lot of organizations in South Carolina are doing. So thank you so much to everybody out there for tuning in and send in your questions. We're going to answer them. We promise. Thanks, buddy. That was great. Yeah. Thank money. you. Thanks yeah. for having me.